So. All right. I think we are live and we are good to go. We're going to let this kind of kick on for a second before I bring on our guest today, who I'm very excited to sit down with and pick his mind. So let's let this kick on for a few minutes and then we will get started. All right. Okay, hi, we're here, we're live. Um, thank you guys so much for um, joining us back for our second edition of SMWS Presents. Um, this is an opportunity to sit down with some really iconic, amazing people in the industry to kind of pick their brains and you know learn more about whiskey and just further our appreciation for it. So today's episode is very exciting for a few reasons. Um, one, this is a person who not only is a master at his craft, but he is also a very supportive member of the society and is a big fan of our whiskeys. And so it's always kind of fun to talk to somebody, you know, on both ends, somebody who is a member and somebody who is out there making amazing and incredible whiskeys. So um, I, I guess without further ado, we'll kick this thing off. And uh, from, let's see, what's, all right, so here we go. So live from Waco, Texas, I'm going to be bringing on master distiller of Balcones out again in Texas and welcome Jared Hempstead. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank we you for being here. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't use master distiller. I use head distiller. Oh, head a, distiller. All right. It's a, it's a subtle thing, but uh, I don't feel like I've mastered much yet. We got way more questions than I have answers. Okay. I also feel like you have to be a good bit older maybe. <laughs> so but All right. Well, head distiller. I you will. Can use, uh, yeah. You know, you can use whatever, whichever you prefer. <laughs> well, thank you for for bringing that to my attention. That's that's a good thing to uh, make note of. <laughs> I guess when you have a full gray beard and a few years on you, then we yeah, can, it's you still know, still bring... so so little so little gray here. <laughs> the master's not there yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seems inappropriate. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much for taking the time to Absolutely. come and talk to us about you know balcones and your mm -hmm. love of whiskey and how you made your way into, into doing this. And uh, so I think this will be fun. I have lots of good questions for you. I'm, I'm really excited personally to kind of pick your, pick your brain on some of these things. So um, I guess first off to just kind of kick it off, one, thank you for being such an awesome member of the society. I can see behind you some bottles hiding back there. And yeah, there's, uh, a, there's a few back there. I've heard that there's a pretty uh, nice collection at the distillery or there's like a room or have I haven't been. Yeah, we have a reference library, and I w it may not be half. It may be a third of what's in there is probably society bottlings. <laughs> but I think anybody who's involved in all the the clubs that are proliferating and group picks and, you know, even eight years ago or so, it was chasing store picks of, like, you know, four rows of single barrel or something, yeah. watching all that dry up, watching it get really hard to get. Um, to me, I've always been, like, behind the scenes, there's this little – club you can join that has all kinds of amazing stuff at way below i mean the value price point wise is just to me it's insane like there's no way i'd get a i don't know a 28 year old unsharied farkless which is just like a unicorn to begin with i would never see it and if i did right. see it it'd be 1200 dollars and not right. 365 which is just nuts right. so i tell everybody and uh i think we've we've done a pretty good job with the event the launch events we've had here for our mm -hmm. releases um, signing people up. And of course, it doesn't take long before they get really angry about their bank account, but <laughs> but also really happy to know this exists. And right. You know, I've never had anyone be like, man, you said it was a really good deal. And I don't, I haven't found it very worth it, you know? Right. Um, so, well, we're, we're very grateful for that. And um, I love that you have a reference library and you know, I can see all kinds of whiskeys behind you. So I well, think this is, yeah, this is just my office. This is the stuff. Oh. <laughs> The, the reference library is down the hall. This is the cabinet that that stuff's all fair game for staff if they want to just do some self education, yeah. walk through a region or kind of, you know, whatever, pick a bunch of ones that are all port finished and, you know, do some self education that way. But no, this is this is the closet if you need, if you have to ask first. This is you need my permission to come in here. Oh, so, all right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'll be sure that when I visit the distillery, I'll have to ask permission to take a look and see what's in there. But, um, <laughs> So I guess to just kind of kick it off, can you kind of give us a, a, a brief history on who, who are you? Who is Jared yeah. Hempstead? How did you kind of find your way into making whiskey? So 
<clears throat> it's kind of a backwards these days. There's a lot of really cool, legitimate ways of getting education and training and even certifications and degrees and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> my, my path is not like a, a blueprint for if you want to get into distilling, here's how you do it. Yeah. Um, uh, I got a homebrew, got some homebrewing equipment as a wedding gift after college and really got into that for a little bit, kind of not as, uh, not as, as committed and, and, and fully immersed as I would have liked, um, partially because I didn't really know anyone else that was doing it. And then a few years later, it was the early 2000s now, ended up finding a group of guys, um, some people that were here in grad school, Baylor, Baylor University is here in Waco. And, um, <clears throat> Next thing we knew, we were having pretty regular monthly meetings and everyone's sharing beer they were making and uh, critiquing stuff. And, you know, everybody at the table, some people have like a, a really solid grasp on the science and some people are yeast health. Some people are super picky about categories and definitions and standards. And some people are really creative. And so it was a really nice, safe way to try things, learn things. Um, and uh, ended up opening a bar with one of the guys that I met through that group. Um, left my non left my nonprofit job. Thought we were going to open a brewery a couple times and turn into brewers, but that uh, I was going to say that never materialized. It actually has materialized because <laughs> finally we're brewing beer here now. Um, oh wow! As, as well as making whiskey. Just started. We just started in February, so we're finally coming full circle to some of the original dreams. But um, yeah, once we opened a bar and had beer just coming out of our pores, I I realized that um, that's a really easy way to get tired of it, and. Uh, so yeah, I had a friend that studied in Oxford and he was he was living with us here in Waco at the time. And uh, I had been given whiskey plenty of times by people and it just never had clicked. You know, people talk about the, the light bulb yeah. going off in that moment and it just yeah. never had happened. Um, and we were out together and he was like, oh, but you probably haven't tried the right stuff. And I know it's kind of backwards. A lot of people end up graduating into heavily peated Isla. But um, yeah, it was our bag. It was just like, oh wow <laughs> and then it was like is there more like this and he's like well there's only at the time what seven because i think it was before kill home it opened so i think there were seven distilleries on i at the time um and he was like well there's only seven of them but there's other stuff too and it just turned into rabid we were both spending way too much of our income we didn't have on <laughs> um just buying every bottle of scotch we could get on the, on the shelf which in central texas and what this is probably like you know, oh four, oh five, oh six. That there wasn't a lot to be seen anyway. Yeah. Um, so we devoured it and uh, just pretty exhaustively. And the the uh, what started is just literally just conversations on the front porch over a dram about we should maybe try making our own and trying to read everything that was available literature wise and trying to talk to people and going to whiskey shows and doing everything you can to find out more about this and what it's, what it's, what it takes to, to lay some down. And then, uh, yeah, we should go look at buildings and we should do this and we should do that. And it really feels like we kind of woke up one day and we had bought a building and our permit applications were in and nobody had quit their jobs or anything. And, uh, <laughs> then a few months of that pretty quickly, we were doing all of our own construction. We were pretty low on money. So we were doing a lot of welding. We were doing a lot of brickwork and demolition of walls and redoing the roof and all that. Um, pretty quickly realized we can't, I can't, I can't be at the distillery from eight to four and then go to the bar from four to, you know, midnight or one and then wake up and right. do that again every day. So yeah, it, uh, and that was under a bridge, uh, right? The first yeah, distillery was under yeah. like a free, a freeway bridge. Yeah. We still have the building. It's only about four or five blocks from here. Okay. Um, it's a little bit under, a little bit under 3000 square feet, pretty tiny little place and everything was there. Um, we, we were distilling there. The barrels were there. We were using all the wow. small barrel. We were using all five gallon barrels at the time. Yeah. Um, There's probably a couple hundred of them. But a few years later, we bought. I think it was 2012 or 2013. We bought the building we're in now and used it just for warehousing mm -hmm. for about three years. And um, at some point, realized we can't produce as much as we need to produce in the little place. So um, chased a little investment, got a little money to, to, to move production down here. And uh, we've been here since uh, I think we commissioned in January and February of uh, 16. So nice. Yeah. It's a little, little more space, a little more elbow room. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's a pretty amazing story though, to just, you know, go from, you know, getting a home brewing kit to 
that leading to you, you finding your love of whiskey to you now, you know, being able to sit here and say that, you know, I'm head distiller, I'm, I'm making it like yeah. what I have here in this bottle, like you made this. And I think that's really just, I think that's so amazing. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty crazy, I mean, we have a lot of folks here that I think still fit that kind of, um, I feel like it's thrown around a lot, but like this, this, you know, people talk about makers or like even, you know, maker spaces and all that stuff, but I haven't really found a much better word for a lot of the personality and culture of the staff. Um, it's just the kind of folks that like, you know, if they use something and if they enjoy something, they're probably going to do a little digging and figure out um, if they can, if they can interact with it more than just consuming it. You know, um, we've got guys that are super into uh, smoking meat, for example, and can just ramble on about the subtle differences and, of humidity and if you're going to use apricot wood versus cherry versus mm -hmm. pecan and you know it's, um got guys that oh i'm going to start making bread and next thing you know it's like they're nerdier about it than you know <laughs> than any of any of the bakeries in town just because that's the kind of folks that yeah. i think we we are so passion to, uh, it sounds yeah. like you have a lot of people who are just passionate people right yeah i think curious and diligent yeah. and um i think we've talked about it a lot in house and it's these are hard things to pin down but i think there's something about um, this dichotomy, which maybe it's a false dichotomy, but maybe a spectrum between a transactional uh, interaction with something and a relational interaction with something. And even if you're willing to just buy and consume it, if you take the time to try your hand and fiddle around with, um, like for me, it was some, well, amongst other things, you know, um, wanting to learn more about bike maintenance because I'm riding one all the time and I've, mm -hmm. it, I felt kind of dependent and I also felt like I didn't really understand this thing that I use a lot. Yeah. Um, and I see that, I see that with our crew in just in different areas. And that's kind of where this started was just to appreciate it more wanting to dabble and have a, have a more direct experience, um, and a handle on some of the, the things, the dynamics involved just turned into never looking back and <laughs> doing it for work. So that brings so much to the table though, when you have, you know, people who are impassioned and dedicated to so many different things, you know, that brings so many ideas to the table, which, you know, could propel, you know, a, a whiskey in one direction or create a, a new whiskey or a new product or. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of our, a lot of the guys, we have a lot of guys that have brewing experience too. We've never had anybody that's ever worked in whiskey before. <laughs> um, so we jokingly, I don't know that we'll keep it that way on purpose, but it has been a little bit of source of pride that we've achieved all this with nobody that's has any formal education nor experience in the industry at all. Um, but some some interesting ideas come out um, when you're just ignorant enough. You know enough to maybe get in a little bit of trouble because uh, you don't know have all the answers and yeah. things that I think maybe industry people and people with uh, certifications and formal whiskey educator, distilling education, maybe wouldn't bother with trying that seemed like good ideas. And some of them weren't, but some of them were. And, uh, you know, there's some unique aspects to our, to our process that came out of some of those, what if, and not knowing, you know, sure that's somebody, that's yeah. where I would get excited, you know, to like take a chance and, you know, <clears throat> maybe be a little risky because you don't know what's going to come from that. Right. And the other that's side of the, the unknown was that, um, you know, whiskey wasn't being made in Texas at the time. Right. Um, and we, we really don't know historically. I'm not a, I'm not a historian. I'm not a researcher. Like guys like Chuck and Fred Minnick and people that do that for work and for that are writers, but we haven't found anything. We know for a fact since prohibition, but there's not necessarily any strong records suggesting that even before that there was any distilleries here, wow. um, which is weird thinking about cowboys and cattle drives and saloons, but I guess they were all drinking Kentucky bourbon. I don't know. Um, yeah. or moonshine or something, there but, <laughs> um, but because of that, us and then Dan Garrison, who got his yep. permit slightly before us, and we were both starting to distill around the same time, um, it was a huge. It was, it was just a huge question mark. Um, not just really having no idea what maturation in Texas was going to look like and what the climate right. was going to do to both the distillation process and and maturation. So, um, I think but, we would have. I think we would have been really disappointed, and and it would have been uh, a really uh, frustrating venture if we had had a plan on no this is what we're going to do this is how it's going to turn out as opposed to kind of let's go along and pay attention <laughs> and uh see 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 what 
kind of whiskey Texas even wants to make, you know, or what it's what the characteristics of this place are and how to how to incorporate them and understand them to where we can be partners, you know, and not uh, constantly fighting right. our, our weather swings and the humidity and then the lack of humidity and all that stuff. So um, that's why I'm jokingly, but I mean, even at 12 years in, it really feels like we still have more questions than, yeah. than answers, you know. But that, I mean, that's, I always tell people that, you know, about whiskey too, is it's one of those things that you'll never get bored with. You'll never run out of things to talk about because I could go my entire life and I won't learn a fraction oh, yeah. of, you know, what this amazing industry has to offer. Absolutely. So I, I love that attitude about it is that it's, there's never a finish line. It's just, yeah. you know, let's just, we're just got to keep going and keep exploring sure. and keep creating. And I think yeah. that's, I love that attitude. Yeah, absolutely. Um, One of the fun things that's also a little frustrating, it gets less frustrating as I get older because I keep getting a little more patient. That's easier to wait on, on things to be ready. <laughs> but, um, the, you know, the feedback loop on, on the research side is so long. I mean, if it takes four or five years to know if something worked out and then you got to tweak it and then yeah. try it again and then tweak it like, yeah, I'll be retired. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, it's the long game. <laughs> Yeah, the, the list of, yeah, the list of things we want to try and look into is, it's not, it's not, every time we cross something off, you know, three or four more things get added, so. Yeah. We're not but going the, to talk. The, the Texas whiskey scene is, is pretty new. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, you know, yeah, related I mean, to, you know, just whiskey, it's, what, about 10, a little over 10 years now? Yeah, so we, our first, uh, we got our, Danon got his permits in 07. I don't know exactly when he started distilling. I think it was maybe 08 or 09. Um, we got our permit in 08, and our first whiskeys were coming out in August 09. Okay. So, yeah, um, we're wow. just com we're coming up on 11 years of whiskey actually made in Texas, in like Texas. Being, being available on the shelf. Ele mean, uh, yeah, 11 years in August. Yeah. And for being such a short amount of time, I mean, the Texas whiskey scene is massive now. I mean, you have a Texas mm -hmm. whiskey trail. Mm -hmm. um, and even, you know, when I was there back in August, I was just like, this is like, a, it's like a playground. There's so many distilleries and, yeah. you know, whiskey just kind of everywhere. And that's where, you know, Whiskeys of the World is, is like in Austin, Texas. And you're just, it's, it's amazing to just see how it has blossomed in such a short amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody, both both America, the American craft scene, for lack of a better word, I know everybody can debate the word craft whether you like it or hate it, but um, I don't think anybody around those those early years had any idea what both what Texas whiskey could turn into and what American craft was going to turn into. It's been pretty nuts, or global craft for that matter. Yeah, um, and it wasn't, you know, we weren't sitting on a bunch of really cool market data that made us aware that this was the right time to jump in. It was just serendip in, in hindsight, it was just, yeah, right place, right time. Yeah. We, we got the bug at the right time. It turns out it was a good time to get the bug and, and jump in with both <laughs> feet. So. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's exciting to, to just see even in just the past, like three years, how much it, it's grown and how much recognition you guys are getting um, for, you know, you're putting out incredible whiskeys. And, you know, when we talk about American single malts, I guess, you know, for a lot of people, they hear single malt and they automatically think, you know, scotch. It's right. That's just where your your brain takes you. Um, but to think of, you know, American single malt, you know, why did was it just your love of single malt scotch that led you to want to make single malt whiskey in the state of Texas? Yeah, I mean, we're <clears throat> even with the variety of things we do now, which really a lot of that just still comes out of that same kind of curiosity. Um, yeah, the original goal before we ever got started was to make single malt here. Um, not, not saying anything else gets less of our attention, you know, the whole idea that you love all your kids, but, right. um, you know, gun to the head, if we could only make one thing, like, there's no doubt in my mind, like everybody involved on the distilling production side, um, product development, all our sensory guys, like, yeah, single malt is, is where we hang our hat for sure. Yeah. Um, which once again, watching, being really involved with the Texas Whiskey Association and also with the American Single Malt Commission there's nobody else involved in both and man i i feel like <laughs> i was gonna ask a, you about those <laughs> right well what, what a crazy thing that yeah that i get to have at least if i don't have my hand on the steering wheel i at least get to have like i get to touch the steering wheel every once in a while with both of those yeah. groups and um i mean for all intents and purposes the legitimate birth of one category which is texas whiskey because it literally didn't exist and if not 
the birth of American single malt because there's absolutely people that were making it before um, we got started. Mm -hmm. But the momentum of, you know, beyond just some, some, a few small producers doing a special release here and there and kind of on the edges of the country to what we have now, you know, we started with six members four years ago and now we've got like, I don't know, 160, I think is the wow. most recent count wow. of, Ameri of American distillers making single malt according to the standard of identity that we've proposed. <clears throat> and man, there wasn't even 160 craft distilleries 10 years ago, much less 160 making single malt. So that's right. <laughs> to watch something, literally the birth of a category is like, that doesn't it, happen often. To be like the foundation of the birth of a category is, that's huge, you know? So. I mean, we don't, yeah. There were people doing it before. It's been right. a group effort, but yeah. it's In um, relation to bringing it to Texas and, sure. you know, making that blossom in Texas. That's that's a pretty amazing thing to, to be a part of. So. Yeah. It's really so, exciting. Can you kind of touch on the Texas Whiskey Association and kind of, um, you know, your role in it and, and what it's like, you know, purposes and how that's kind of changing the landscape of, you know, whiskey in Texas? Yeah, I think we started having conversations maybe as long as six years ago about it. And in hindsight, I think we all are glad that we didn't jump the gun because at the time there would have been like literally two or three, whis maybe four whiskey distilleries in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and it definitely seemed like, just like other people are noticing, whether everything from press to, um, I feel like there's just stories coming out constantly about the Texas whiskey scene and the momentum seemed right to kind of try and get everyone together and galvanize um, both the establishment of the trail, which kind of is more the public facing side of, um, it's amazing how, how many people just don't know if you're not, oh, I'm like really into whiskey. If you're someone who just kind of casually drinks whiskey, we meet people all the time that don't even know we're in Waco. Um, or that whiskey's made it all in Texas. So we definitely felt like that was a story there that needed to be heard, uh, yeah. not drastically different from the mission of the uh, American Single Malt Commission. Um, there's, it's a little bit twofold. There's a story there to be told. And um, there's also uh, something beautiful and vibrant about what's happening in that, in this area with whiskey that deserves to be um, somewhat protected and, uh, on, on both those groups, realizing that we're all running around trying to do education and um, by our, on our own, just yeah. really duplicating the same work and how much stronger of a voice that would be if, um, if the, you know, the story was being told collectively. Yeah. And then the, tra the trail side for Texas, you've, you've got you've to provide a, um, an interactive, you know, a, an engagement piece to this thing especially our goal, we weren't really trying, we're not really running around trying to be like a lobbying group or start a pack or anything. Um, it really was about not having the, the, the brand that is Texas, which is a strong brand. It's a huge state with a lot of whiskey volume being consumed. Um, and there's a, there's a, there's an appeal to coming in here and throwing a cowboy hat and some spurs on a bottle of some whiskey made sometimes in another state, sometimes even in another country yeah. or throwing our flag on a felt bag. And, um, and Texans usually feel kind of gypped when they find out where some of that stuff actually comes from, yeah. um, which is which is sad and frustrating when they think they're doing their job to support some local stuff and create local jobs, create local agriculture, and to find out they're not. Yeah. Um, so part of it was that and just realizing like, man, we can't keep winning awards globally, you know, nationally uh, over and over and over with these Texas whiskey distilleries just to go out on the streets and go out to bars in Austin and have people not even know it's there. Right. It's like we we've got to do better. I think the 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 momentum of the scene and the quality of the liquid being made here deserves it just deserves better than that. And so yeah, yeah I we were all really busy at the time. You know, everyone's scrambling, doing everything they can, get the whiskey out the door and pedal it and get it in bars and get yeah. it on the menus and get it in the liquor store. A lot of work. <laughs> Meetings with distributors, all that stuff, just the the daily grind of 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 making and getting your whiskey sold. Um and not everybody even had, I haven't even visited all of our members. I mean, it's, we're just, you know, you know how it is. So there'll be some day where it'll yeah. all be cushioned easy and we'll just do whatever's fun. But right for now, everyone's, um, yeah, there's work to do. So yeah. we, I just started getting together the few people I knew and it turns out to my surprise, a lot, how many people had never even met each other and knew each other by name, um, just to start kind of sitting down and what could this look like? And our executive director, Spencer had been talking 
to, to me about this. We've been, we've been having conversations about it for, like I said, a good five, six years and the time finally just seemed right. And, um, Next thing we knew, and you don't always agree, and you just you, know, you throw up this point and you disagree and a counterpoint. And yeah. You eventually come up with something, both the mission of the organization, the, what Texas whiskey means to the group, how are we gonna, how are we gonna start education campaigns, how are we gonna tell the story, and um, that that was a lot of work too. So it's not quite herding cats, but I mean Spencer would probably say it's worse than herding cats, trying <laughs> trying to get us all on the same page. But, um, but yeah, and I think it's been a great thing. We got to do a lot yeah. of really. I, I love we're kind of in an era with food, with wine, um, with a lot of things, even with like music we consume. Um, we kind of want to know a lot more than was necessary before. Yes. We want to meet people. We want to hear the story. If we can visit someplace and see stuff and growing in the ground, that's going to make the end up being this product. Even if we're at the restaurant and the guy can say, yeah, this, this is the beef is from this farm and it's this many miles away or right. It's right outside of whatever town. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're just in a little slightly more informed era of For sure. I agree. Being, a, being a consumer of anything. And, um, and as a producer, I love that wall kind of being down that in the historically has been there. Um, and the whiskey groups around the country are a huge part of uh, facilitating. I think a lot of, there's no veil here. There's no secrets come in. If you want, sometimes you can even get in there and get your hands dirty and shovel some grain out of an ash ton and I love you know, that. <laughs> jump on the bottling line and, um, yeah, just all of those kind of illusory boundaries of who's making yeah. it and who's consuming it. We can kind of blur that and uh, the collaborative nature of the associations uh, treating this as kind of a group project that everyone benefits from all the way down to, you know, um, local clubs that do their single barrel picks. And we've gotten to do some stuff with the trail. Uh, we did a blending class here and walked them through. And really, it was about a four I hour. Take that. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Um, I realized after the fact we maybe had slightly different goals. I think their 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 plan was, oh, in like four hours, twenty people, which was an insane thing to even try to do. That somehow yeah. we're we're just gonna end up with this really awesome bottling. Um, and I guess that had never even crossed my mind. I figured we were gonna have a very real experience of what blending is like with all of its mm -hmm. ins and outs and frustrations and failures and try this and wow, that didn't do what I thought it would, and blah, blah, blah. And it kind of ended up being a mix of both. The bottling was good. Um but at the end of four hours, they were definitely like, wow, I, I just thought I thought we would be much further along in four hours. Like that, right. that's a lot. There's a lot to do and a lot to check and things to try. And I was like, yeah, that's usually something that might take us two to three weeks. So, yeah, four hours. Is quite <laughs> enough. Um, Not just, just pouring just, a bunch of yeah. stuff in a in a barrel and calling it a day. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it was fun. And I we. we You've, we've watched people in the marketing around whiskey, whether it's Tennessee, Kentucky, Scotland, you know, generations past has had a lot of fluff. It seems like a little bit of an intentional, um, uh, you know, hierarchy to it. You're supposed to be at the foot of the master odd and just like, you know, happy that you're even allowed to be there kind of thing, as opposed to um, sharing everything we know. We're, we're really the same thing where we are our consumers. We are our fans, you know, um, yeah. as you can see, I'm like, I, I chase special releases and I buy stuff that I, I don't love, need. And yeah, so I know like, yeah, it's a full circle. Like I know the things I would want to know and ask. And when someone kind of obfuscates or they don't really know, or they don't want to tell you. And it's like, man, all this enriches the experience and um, a more educated, informed consumer just makes my life more fun. It makes my life easier. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it just makes us more peers. And like I said, that that line yeah. between production and consumption can go away and we can yeah. always be part of this community that loves this thing, you know? Uh, That's how this feels. Like even right. just the conversation, I like feel like I could just like, you know, stroll in and we would just, you know, be friends and sure. we would sit and drink whiskey. And like, like I love, that's what I love about, you know, this is that it is, you know, the, the human connection part of mm -hmm. you know, this little drink is, is, that's the magic, you know, yeah. just bringing people together. And uh, it seems like Texas is like one just big whiskey making family and you're all <laughs> just, I mean, I'm sure it's not, you know, always that way. I'm sure there's, you know, there's always that one guy, but. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's, I hope I'm not the guy. No. Um, no, I might no. be. Um... But it feels very connected and it feels very like everyone's in it for each other and it's not, you know, we're just in it for ourselves. And yeah, I we all do such very different things and the, 
the irony about talking about climate even in Texas is that, you know, if we're talking about specific like microclimates and bioregions, it really mm -hmm. should be, depending on whose map you look at, it could easily be eight different states or 12 different states. Mm -hmm. um, so what the guys deal with down in the Gulf Coast or what Dan deals with down in the Hill Country uh, versus what we're dealing with here or somebody, um, you know, the the Iron Root Republic guys up in Den up in uh, Denison near the near the mm -hmm. Oklahoma border, we all have radically different dynamics that we are having to deal with. Um, so while there is some aesthetic similarities that maybe are starting to show up that have to do with extreme temperature swings, mm -hmm. um, other than that, there's a lot of stuff that is very specific to every single distillery. And um, to me, that 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 just continues the conversation of figuring out what Texas does to whiskey and where and how. And um, yeah, there's a lot of sharing. I, there's not a whole lot of people withholding secrets or, you know, gonna like mislead or trick somebody. There's a lot yeah. of um, camaraderie and helping each other out. And even down to simple things like, you know, helping somebody get a contract for grain or barrels or, you know, somebody's out of something and you've got extra, you know, get them, get somebody to run it down to them and all that. So um, it sounds kind of like the, the climate there is kind of similar to what they experience out in Australia with just these you know, the, the weather's so different and, and can be different, you know, it could be hot one day, it could be humid one day, it could right. be dry one day. Um, and, yeah. you know, all these microclimates throughout the whole state. So was that, was that a challenge for you guys to try and sure. figure out how, okay, like we have this, you know, this recipe, we have this, you know, base now, how are we going to, you know, mature this with this weather that we don't know anything about, or it fluctuates on such a, an right. erratic scale? Yeah, no, I mean, we, we still, that's, that's probably that's, the, if I had to put bullet points on things that we're still interested in and curious about and have ideas about how to work better with the, with the weather, mm -hmm. that still is always at the top of the list. I mean, um, it's really easy to get wood extraction. So if you want to get tan and you want to get spice, you want to get, you know, caramelized wood sugar, that stuff's all easy color. No problem. I feel bad for, I've got friends, you know, John Little from smooth Ambler always gives me a hard time that I might be pouring like a two or two and a half year old, whiskey right next to something he's got that's seven years old and it's you know twice as dark i mean this is like look how beautiful that is yeah that's yeah that's just a little, probably just a little bit over two years yeah, yeah I and mean, that's um, gorgeous but um but that also creates a problem if you want balanced you know all the other aspects of maturation that can't be they have to to end up with something harmonious you've got to figure out a way to um help those you know stay at a similar pace Mm -hmm. so that by the end you don't have one thing that's way out of whack and something else that's not quite ready so we've had to play a lot with barrel size to kind of min minimize the dangers of, of over wooded stuff um entry proof is a big thing you, we you know we use to manipulate how, how how tannic and spicy something can get um we also front load our fermentations with just a really high volume of acid and pretty low ph mm -hmm. so that the the esterification side of what's happening both in the stills and in the barrels can um, it's kind of got a little bit of a head start on the on the wood extraction um, so that all the development of all those fun fruit flavors and nice solventy notes and stuff um, obviously the, the more raw material we give uh, the barrel to build those things with uh, the better chance it has of keeping up with the wood but yeah um, we're I'm trying to find right now I'm trying to convince our cooperage to build me some um, max size so like 700 liter uh virgin oak barrels so we can do american styles in i mean i have a bunch of really big barrels that we can do single malt in um but kind of the the nagging question still for us is can we even do something 8 10 12 year and have it not be gross right. and unbalanced <laughs> and also have anything left you know because it's sometimes yeah. at five six years a barrel is like a third full you know so wow um loss is pretty drastic and and they're not good they're yeah. they're, they're they're usable in blends but on their own they're not they're not tasty and they're just, they're, they're really nice spikes for wet accents, but that's about it. So yeah. what is the so, oldest yeah. whiskey you guys have? Uh, I probably have to go look I, we probably have some things around the you know high sixties to low 70 months. Um, the oldest thing we have in building is rum. Actually, we've got a rum barrel that's about seven and a half years old. Um, but it was a very, very, very used barrel. Um, but yeah, but you know, for a lot of the American whiskey styles, we use barrels not going to work. So, yeah. um, like I said, we've, we've, we've just installed a bunch of uh, five, five and 600 liter uh, cherry barrels of different types upstairs for our prolonged, can we make a 10 years, 12 yeah. year old single malt in Texas project? Um, 
and hopefully it will stay there forever and we can just keep filling them and you know who knows we'll see what happens but yeah, yeah that's a fun experiment well yeah. kind of speaking of your raw ingredients to kind of go back to that mm -hmm. um so i know in your can you talk a little bit about um why you decided to use blue corn yeah it's actually not that complicated of a story it, it, it might be a little bit of ignorance or maybe we're just iconoclastic enough but um finding out that a lot of american whiskey history had to do with yellow corn and a lot of times not even you know food grade this is you know this is stuff that's raised for grown for animals for feed we were just kind of like that doesn't make any sense to use that for yeah. something that should be delicious um <laughs> and like we we're talking about earlier with kind of overlap of interests being in texas um you know with food there's ingredients that kind of come and go and things seem to be kind of hot for a little bit but down here especially from central texas west towards california um you know blue corn as a as a as a as a food staple is not that's a very common thing and so the, just the original idea was just like surely we can do better than a just doing what's always been done before what's the point of that and also something that is relevant and local and is familiar um yeah it just kind of made it seemed a little bit obvious made, at the yeah. time um and we tried a bunch of different ones uh and we tried even some local yellow corns and stuff but um pretty quickly just getting samples in we were boiling stuff up literally just kind of making like grits out of it and smelling and tasting things and uh pick, pick the corn that we yeah. we run with we've had it grown a couple of different places but as of about probably five or six years ago it's about grown in texas you know 100 so okay um, and yeah. are you using all texas ingredients at this point or are you, are you no. attempting to get to that point or can you get to that point this is always a tricky area to talk about and i <laughs> i've been on panels many times both in texas and all, with single malt stuff where that that question gets asked and i just am yeah. lucky, un, unlucky enough to be sitting at the end of the stage and everyone goes oh yeah oh yeah absolutely yeah without a yeah. doubt and then it gets to me and i'm like ah, a little bit <laughs> but part of part of my concern with it is um it can be kind of a knee-jerk uh, unnatural thing um and i've, I've seen like even with hop growing, for example, in Texas, watching brewers in the last, during the last wave of craft brewing, try to kind of force that on a mm -hmm. place that it really doesn't want to be. And if if you're someone that has overlapping Venn diagrams of things that you really matter to you, making whiskey matters to you, using local ingredients is important to you. If there's also an environmental component to, you know, your values, that's a that's just a bad idea to use yeah. that amount of water. Um, and for something that's uh, really kind of unnatural uh, on on the on the landscape. So, yeah. so yes, right. we are. The the sh I mean, that's the short answer. I we are growing barley in Texas. We use things that are easy to grow here that mm -hmm. don't require a whole lot of work. So there's a lot of corn here. There's a lot of rye. There's a lot of wheat. Those are easy, no problem. So yes, all of that. We are growing and using malted barley grown and malted in Texas, but that's pretty recent. We've been only been doing that for about three or four years. Wow. It's kind of still in the early stages of figuring out what that's going to be like. And yeah. even every year, the farmers keep planting different varieties, um, trying different farms, trying different you know farming methods to get that better yields. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of brand new. A um, uh, couple of malting houses that worked that we work with really closely, one in specific uh, had been working with the agriculture school down in College Station, Texas A&M, for a mm -hmm. while to kind of develop a strain that could be drought and heat resistant and it just took a while to pull that off um but no most of our barley historically has been golden promise um scottish barley um it feels really fun to nod to the the whiskeys that we fell in love with that got us started in the first place especially since it's a variety that has fallen out of favor on that side of the pond yeah um to kind of in some ways get to play with a grain that's that's what they were doing, you know, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and uh, continue that tradition over here is pretty fun. We had to, um, we have started laying down some peat about four years ago, and I didn't want any other variables. I just wanted peat to be the variable. So when I talked to the Simpsons family about getting peat at Golden Promise, and they're like, we don't do that. <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, and I explained why we didn't want to get concerto or whatever else they were yeah. peating at the time. Um, and they said, well, if you take the whole peating floor, if you take the whole malting floor, you can take it which meant like a whole truckload. Yeah. So we had to say no and say no for a few years. But once we moved down here in 2016, it was like, yeah, we're, we can take that now. We want it. Yeah. Um, but I've been trying to chase down some, 
some, tell me about this. <laughs> I've been trying to chase down some whiskeys that were made with Peter Golden Promise, you know, and uh, I need to convince my my investors that to to let me spend the money on, you know, like a ninety five. Yeah, yeah. I found like a ninety five <laughs> or ninety six, you know, Kurosawa auction for like three grand, and like that's probably not going to happen. But right. but it's but it sucks. I don't have any references. I don't have any Peter Golden Promise single malts lying around that I can even drink side by side with what we're making. But yeah. um, to know that to know from them that we're the only people laying that down literally on the planet right now. And that used to be very common, you know, 30, 40 years ago. It was pretty cool. So Yeah, that's that's super exciting. And 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 talking about, you know, Pete, mm -hmm. um, I'm uh, Pete is like my I'm I have to ask just because I have I'm gonna be selfish here for a moment. Mm -hmm. I have this love for Pete and mm -hmm. learning about it and just knowing as much as I can about it. And so I heard that there might be some Pete in Texas, which is like, can yeah. you, yeah. is there? It's it's turning into, <laughs> it, it kind of relates is to, there? yeah, there is, there absolutely yeah. is. Um, I found a paper, this was probably about three years ago, I found a paper, there was an agricultural paper mm -hmm. on peat uh, that was for agricultural use. And so someone had done a survey of all of this, there's just all this uh, swamp, marshy lands, you know, the piney, the piney woods area, and south of yep. that on the east coast of Texas, on the eastern border, down to the coast. And there is a lot of wetlands down there. And somebody had bothered to go through and do take core samples and and map everything out, plot lines, you know, latitude, longitude, the whole thing, um, analysis of all these different areas, how much was estimated to be there, how deep it went, blah blah blah. Which things were you suitable for agriculture? What parts were suitable for fuel? Um, and Gabe is my blending partner. I kind of gave him, this is the second year, I think in a row where I've said, no, this literally, this is the year that's your homework assignment. We need to get a realtor. I don't know how we do this. We need to find out who owns those properties. We need to go talk to some people. The sad part about the story is that a lot of the folks in the area, uh, feel like those wetland areas aren't protected enough. Yeah. And they're kind of a rare vestige of that part of the state and the landscape yeah. in that part of the state. So now we're kind of stuck <laughs> once again, sense. we're stuck with these overlapping value systems where like yeah. we really, really want to play with that. And at the same time, the more we hear from the residents of the area, it just seems like we probably could go get it yeah. done and we'd be at odds with their wishes and their, their hopes that this area could be protected and preserved. Yeah. So I really, at this point, I don't know if that's going to happen, Yeah. which is a huge bummer. And saying it out loud, that probably means someone else who won't care about the environmental well, impact will go down there and do it and beat us to the punch. But well, you um, have that's that's like your moral compass, you know, telling you like yeah. the right thing. You're doing the right thing, and I just can't imagine that's admirable. Going, yeah, I can't imagine going in there and snagging it out from no, you know, or somebody's somebody who's willing to mess up the area for some money. Yeah, um, knowing everybody in the area is just like doesn't want this to happen. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how likely that is now. We'll see. Yeah, well, um, it's a bummer. It's a yeah, it's a huge bummer research you know. wise to find out it's here, which seemed like yeah, this Pete in Texas. Right. That, nobody would say that's like yeah, that's never gonna. I happen. know when I when I read that, I was like, I guess it makes sense because there is like wet land. There is you sure. know those kind of swampy, marshy lands. But uh, I guess it's just you know to put those two things together, it's exciting. Yeah, but it doesn't seem like an obvious connection. And then to find right. it was super exciting, and then equally yeah. disheartening to find out we probably shouldn't do this. <laughs> Well, the fact that you're doing the right thing, I think, you know, takes the sting away a little because it's, you're doing the right thing. So, well, well thanks. We, uh, <laughs> yeah, it'll always, so, be a, it'll always be a question mark though, I think for, yeah. for our, the curious side of us. But, well, yeah. I'm going to segue into some questions sure. from the audience here. Yeah. Let's kind of see who is here and to say hello. Um, Gretchen Galladay is here. Did I say mm -hmm. that right? Um, hello, Gretchen. Mm -hmm. And let's see, I think I saw some questions in here. I gotta dig through here. Everyone, Daniel, hi, Josh, Zach, Steve, hi, Wes, hello. I'll be, I talked to so many of you guys today. Um, there was a question about, um, let's see, Matt asked, what about some of that lovely pita golden promise in Madeira or French oak cask? Huh, um, we are mostly laying down the, the peated releases we've done for anybody in Texas who's gotten a hold of the last two, those were intentionally done in virgin oak. 
but once again, it, it was there's there's always for me there's always a, a desire to share some of the things we discover, whether or not it's the most perfect rendition of a thing or not. So on yeah. those releases, I really wanted to barrel it the same way we barrel our flagship one single malt, so that it would be more of a side by side comparison. That said, we really do prefer them going into refill. So we're doing a lot of ex bourbon. We're doing even ex rumble, which is another you know one of our spirits. Um, and there are some wine finishes. Uh, who asked that question? It might be facetious. Uh, Matt C. Okay, I don't, I'm not sure. I totally know who that is, but there's some people that might be commenting on here that are facetious because they've had some of the wine finish <laughs> stuff, um, and they know they know where we're headed with it. But yeah, there's some really beautiful ways of showcasing that. Um, I don't have any in Madeira right now. I do have some in used French oak, and I do have some in some uh, some really tasty uh, dessert wine, but not Madeira. We do have some Madeira uh, Golden Promise, not the peated. Um, there's a really cool winery hack down near the coast that does um, uh, a Madeira style of fortified, you know, the stufa and all that stuff. And we've gotten a bunch of barrels from them. And that's exciting. Um, yeah, I feel like there's the, uh, we joke internally about the uh, the wine barrel arms race, you know, someone's <laughs> got to keep trying to find something that no one's ever found before. Yeah. Um, but there is this dessert wine that no one, I've ne literally never met anyone that knows about it. And everyone should because it's delicious if you could find it. It's called okay. Rataf it's Rataffia. But it's, yeah, writing it's, the, that down. it's the dessert wine version of champagne. Oh. So we had a guy that approached us who is a champagne producer and Ratafia producer in yeah. France. And he's been here and he's visited and he bought some whiskey to finish and sell as an independent bottler. So ironically, we've never sold yeah. any ourselves, but he's sold Balcones single barrels that were finished in Ratafia barrels in France. Interesting. Um, but we do have some coming. And so any other whiskey producers watching, we've got dibs. We called the front seat. <laughs> On, you on heard Rataphia. it here first, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, it's, it's an endless world. I mean, even even with Scotch, you would have never seen, you know, you know, Moscatel and Lupiac yeah. and all these like crazy things. It was, you know, it's it's Oloroso PX Port. That's about it. You know what? Maybe yeah. five six years ago, a few Madeiras here and there, but pretty I'm uncommon. Say, yep. And uh, it's really fun to see that just exploding because there's so much cool stuff. Tokai. I mean, it's really kind of endless if you want to mess around with dessert wine. Yeah. So you, you've not tasted your whiskey in those casks yet. You have some coming, so you can taste it, or have you tasted it? The, the, barrel, the barrels are coming later in the year. Okay. I have the I have the stuff he sold. Yeah. You, you've, so, and you, what is that like? Yeah. What kind of flavor does uh, that like impart on whiskey? I, I mean, the you know some of the um, kind of the mineral minerality, and sometimes I, I don't know if everybody else you can almost there's almost some cheesiness to yes. to a to a really bright acidic champagne. Um, there's there's a good bit of that. There's some nuttiness on there too. Um, he picked barrels from us that were pretty pretty oaky, mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure how that was going to go, but it played with the fruit really nice, um, very differently than it would have I think if it had been like a refill, like an ex bourbon, something much lighter. Um, so it already had a lot of wood sugar. It already had a, a decent amount of spice and tannin and stuff and structure. Um, but it's really cool. I I don't know where it is. I've got a bunch of more, <laughs> but uh, he sent me he sent me the whole line. So he's bought he's. Can't remember all the other distilleries. He did a release of six. So he bought six single barrels, wow. finished them, and, and sold them. And some of them are Irish, some are Scotch, some are ours is American. But um, yeah, they're pretty fun. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I love that. That I get and like ex sauternes cask. I kind of get that cheesy, mm -hmm. like blue cheese almost quality. Yeah. And I love that in just any kind of spirit. So oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, th so I can't remember. I can't remember which. Can't remember which Octomore release it was. It was one of the white bottles a few years back that was just so fruity and floral. Uh, it was definitely, oh man, you don't see that much, that level of fruit with peat mm -hmm. often. Um, yeah, and I think white dessert wines and peat, that combo is way overdue and way <laughs> under underexplored. Um, it's overdue. It's overdue to yeah. have its day. Yeah, I can agree with you so. on that. I'm, I'm all on that train. So what is in your glass, if I may ask? So, I've got our th I've got our three releases here. You said you don't even have any of them. Which I is... don't. Yeah, I haven't had them yet. So. So yeah, I've got all three of the one forties, which are, that's us. We got one forty. Nice. Uh, so I've, yeah, I've got one, two, and three here. So. I know a lot kinda... of our members who are watching have them as well. So. Yeah, I'm just going back and forth between all three. I've got them all open. I'm just kind of <laughs> put a little water in, go back. You know. Yeah. Seeing, that's seeing the how they've been. Part. I haven't. Just, yeah, it's fun to go back. We we stay so busy with blending that it's nice to have an excuse to go back and open things when, uh, 
Yeah, it's easy to find an excuse not to drink more because we're already yeah. drinking so much during the day. So yeah. it was a nice chance to go back and revisit these. Yeah, I'm on the. I have the pot still bourbon, which I it's you. It's so fantastic. I almost well, get like a a cherry. It almost kind of reminds me of like a cherry coke. Yeah, like yeah. if there if bourbon could be a cherry coke, this would be it. Um, and I love that. I think it would be really good on ice cream too. Yeah. Oh wow! <laughs> so yeah, I, that's I have a good to idea. try. I yeah. have to try that. But um, so pot still bourbon. Mm -hmm. No continuous stills in your distillery, just no, pot stills. I don't even. I wouldn't have any idea what to do with a column still. Yeah, I wouldn't know how to run that thing. I don't, <laughs> it doesn't seem very appealing. The idea of just, everything I know about the process doesn't sound super engaging to me. Yeah, um, kind of a you, set it, you know, set it up and let it go kind of thing. Push, yeah. a, push a red button and come back when it's finished. So or you feel like you have more control with the pot still. You can. It's, it's more interactive. I mean, yeah, um, yeah I think. There's plenty of, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of column still made whiskeys that I love, rum and, you know, Kentucky bourbons yeah. and grain whiskeys from, from the UK too. Um, the idea of using it, it's kind of like, you know, it's not that big a deal, but there's people that are pretty, you know, get pretty adamant that they want to drive a car that's got a stick shift, you know, there's just, yeah. you're, it, you're not getting to check out as much um, and doing something that requires a little engagement just feels a little more meaningful to me personally yeah. just as a distiller um and i honestly wouldn't have any i wouldn't have a clue what i was doing with a column still i don't <laughs> even know how those things work the, the, the theory it makes sense in theory but uh, right yeah and they're kind of you. intimidating looking all their little windows yeah. and yeah and I, i'll probably i'll probably put my foot in my, my my mouth saying this but i don't personally i'll say i don't personally know of anyone who ever switched from pot to column mm -hmm. because of taste mm -hmm. you know it's an industrial adaptation that made making whiskey easier and more efficient and less labor intensive. Um, if, if I'm wrong, somebody, somebody says something really ugly in the comments, but um, I, I've never heard anyone say that that's why they chose it. So yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is part of the reason the pot still and some of the other American whiskey styles we make are, are a little odd for people at first yeah. is that we are doing them on a pot and you know, the large, large majority of American, bourbon and rye has, is not made that way. Yeah. And so there are some notes and there's some texture and some oily things that go on that are just yes. not, that are not what people are used to if you just want Kentucky bourbon. So. And, that, and that's what I was going to say, the, 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 the weight, like mm -hmm. there's such, they're weightier whiskeys and there's yeah. viscosity to them and there's great mouthfeel and you yeah. definitely get that oiliness that comes yeah. through. And that's, you know, I get stoked when I see a pot still bourbon. And you I've know, heard I, people say like, oh, well, that's, you know, it, it's maltier than bourbon usually is to me. And um, yeah. If you're if you're a Scotch buyer and you're also a Kentucky bourbon buyer, it's, if it's reminding you of that, you might they might be pot still uh, influence that you're actually getting and not yeah. the grain, you know. But uh, yeah. there's a little bit of education we've had to do, I and mean, we have to do some education around that stuff, you know. Um, yeah, it's yeah. These would be great whiskeys to you know people who kind of started out in Scotch. That was me. That was where I started. Was you know I was a Scotch head, and that was I wasn't a huge fan of bourbon when I first got into it, um, just because I always found them to be very sweet. And, you know, I was like, it's just too sweet. But I think, you know, a pot still bourbon, you know, to kind of segue into the world of bourbon, especially if you're coming from a scotch, you know, sure. landscape, I think these are great whiskeys to, to get you into into bourbon, you know. Yeah. So, and, you know, most of our American styles were an afterthought because we, the goal really was just to make single malt. Well, not just, but that was, yeah. everything was built around that. So we have a facility that is extremely traditional. We have Spayburn's old mash town that was decommissioned a few years back. Um, you know, Forsyth stills, all that stuff. It's, yeah. We use M1 yeast for everything, even in American style. So we're using very traditional Scotch yeast, um, even to do rye and bourbon with. So there's plenty of things about it. Once we decided to play around with American styles, it's like, well, we built the place we built and we do what we do. So we'll see wh where that takes us. And that's some of the newest journeys have been like the pot still hasn't even been out two years. Yeah. So those are the those are the most exciting fledgling journeys we're on. I mean, malt, <laughs> we're a good decade into making malt and uh, still feel excited. But the uh, doing American whiskey styles feels like, man, there's so many question marks. There's so many things that are that we need to learn that are different from from uh, some of the other things we've made for a long time. Yeah. So. so do you see, I guess, just to kind of all wrap it up. So if anybody out yeah. there has any questions for Jared, um, you know, please kind of send them in and, and we'll see if we can get him to answer them. Um, actually, I see a few coming in, but I'll ask you kind of one last question and then we'll jump into yeah. those and we'll let you go. But um, the, the American single malt scene, do you see this continuing to just flourish and blossom and grow? And I mean, 
I hope so. It's kind of like the Texas thing. I've, I yeah. told Spen- I told Spencer when we first started the Texas Whiskey Association that there's so much good will, there's so much good juice, there's so much momentum that really we 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 bad on us if we go and screw this up if we don't take advantage of this time and place to really push this forward and, and blow it up. That's on us. Yeah. The liquid's there. The excitement from people, press, awards, you name it, all that's there. The let the let the the groundwork's been laid. We just need to not screw this up, basically. So um American single malt's <laughs> exciting. And really, it's really just kind of the last most recent to me chapter of just the, the world single malt, the outside of UK single malt conversation. Um anybody who's into single malts has been watching India, Taiwan, I mean you name it, obviously Japan, um, and finding out how this plays. How does this really cool tradition play in different places in the world with different conditions. And um, it, if you're a single malt fan, it's a, it's, it's been a good decade and we're to be alive. And we've, I think we've yeah. got a couple more behind us and not everything's going to work, but we're going to discover some regions that like, Whoa, they're not doing anything crazy different, but that area just, there's something about what's going on there. And whether it's microflora and wild yeast that are getting into the open fermentation or whether it's the maturation climate, we're going to keep finding some things and there's going to be some real gems uh just that didn't even literally didn't even exist on the planet yeah. it couldn't couldn't have existed anywhere except where they're happening um which yeah i just think that's really exciting to watch the landscape expand like that yeah it'll be interesting so. to see even in two years five years you know god oh yeah years, that absolutely it's gonna be yeah just to to see what this all looks and tastes like in that time mm-hmm. so yeah yeah. So, all right. I'm going to dig into some of these questions real quick. Yep. And uh, so let's see. So Scott, oh, oops, okay. So Skywarn engineer asked, what was it like collaborating with Shiner? So you guys did a Bach. Texas. Yeah. Yeah. That was actually pretty fun. They called us and I, I've, jo- I've said it jokingly, but I, I can't remember, you know, somebody buzzes in and tell me that the head, the, the master brewer from Shiner's on the phone. Mm-hmm. And I thought somebody was messing with me. I took the call anyway. And I'm like sitting there trying to figure out which friend of mine it is. Right. <laughs> and, um, and pretty quickly realized just from like the tone of voice and he was not joking and he was being very serious and wanted to know details that it was, it was really Tom, their master brewer. So, yeah. um, we got, we went down there met with their marketing team and some of their sales folks and him, and they had some ideas and it, it, it went, it, originally their idea was pretty simple just to like get some barrels from us and um, do some barrel age releases. And we had said, yeah, we, a lot of us have brewing background. I just don't, I don't want to just sell you barrels. We'd like to be involved in like even the, 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 the development of these beers and the final product, even um, finding out what things are good, what things are working and not working. And uh, so we've gotten to do that. There's already been two, two beer releases from Shiner that were done in our barrels. And they just picked up, I think, 90 more barrels a few weeks back. Um, but they seemed like it was no big deal when we said, yeah, we'd like to make Shiner Bach into a whiskey as well. Mm-hmm. And they were like, they thought we were like being weird. And we thought we, we thought we, <laughs> we thought we won the lottery out of, out of the deal. We were like, man, yeah. we're really, we're really winning this. The end the, we got the really sweet end of this deal. So they came up um, they brought us a bunch of their lager yeast and all these stainless drums full of their liquid yeast. That's proprietary. Um, and uh you know, we literally did did exactly their mash bill and their recipe. Yeah. We obviously we didn't boil it, we didn't hop it, um, and then we from there on out we treated it the way we treat all of our single malts, and uh, it's definitely different. And it got us really excited about lager yeast, which we'd never used before, and lagering temperatures for for malt fermentation. Even just coming off the stills, we knew like this is not this is not like what we normally get. Um, so we did one round. Uh, it was gone really quick. There might be a few bottles still fluttering on the state. Um, we figured it would be pretty, it would go pretty fast. There's a lot of people that drink Shiner that maybe don't drink whiskey normally that yeah. walking up and basically, I mean, the, the label was pretty much almost exactly the Shiner label, yeah. which I also was surprised. They were like, okay with me doing that. Um, <laughs> especially cause we didn't have a whole lot of legal agreements and stuff signed. It was just like handshake pat on the a back. Like this, yeah. But, um, so Shiner, if you're listening, thanks for letting me use all your trademarked, uh, graphics. <laughs> but, but I think we're, I think we are going to continue the relationship once we realized how quickly this moved and how much we've heard probably more complaints on from people that didn't get it than people that did and liked it yeah. so um yeah we're gonna keep keep exploring that a little bit it was fun it was a lot of fun we've done we've done similar things with american solera up in oklahoma and jester king and um jester king yeah our, our beer our our beer interest goes so deep like the, the 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 idea of getting to work with people 
beyond just hey you put your beer that you already make in our barrels that have whiskey that, you know that we already make yeah. but to to step it up and collaborate on whiskey developments or beer developments and some synergy from those two things is really fun so hopefully there'll be a lot more of that in the next coming years very cool yeah um so another question was when you're not drinking balcones what is your go-to whiskey and that's from rebecca that's a tough one i you know i work on the sensory side and we're always drinking stuff the majority of my collection you can see, i'll i'll just pull what the closest thing to me is i mean everything that i have in my collection is about that empty because i open something and i have a couple drinks out of it and before i come back to that there's something else that showed up and there's something yeah. else that showed up <laughs> um and so yeah i don't have a go-to probably the closest and i've answered this to people a couple of times more when it's framed like the, the desert island whiskey um a whiskey, oh, yeah, there you go. a whiskey that's just really comfortable to me and always feels like home going back to it. It's affordable. It's easy to find. Um, it's not overpriced or overappreciated. It's, I think it's actually underappreciated. But yeah, Farkless 12 is one of my, I feel like I constantly have to send people down that path that have passed on it because it's not super fancy packaging and the labels are the same since who knows how long they haven't updated those things. Yeah. Um, but what a great value and should, in my opinion, should be one of the like, top of everyone's list with kind of traditional fit sherry finishing and um, just a great bang for the buck. Yeah. That's a um, good call. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll have one last question for you. Um, do you guys serve or sell a white dog or is Texas white rum as close as it gets? We have never sold white whiskey. Um, I know that was real. Well, I wouldn't even say real popular. There was a lot of crap distilleries doing that mm -hmm. partly to, to generate money during the startup years. Um, legally. And, and you know, I, I don't remember if the TTB changes have affected white whiskey, but up until I, th I think it's still in effect, but white whiskey is not really technically a thing. Like to be whiskey, it has to spend some time in a barrel. Of course they don't uh, specify the minimum time. So it could be 30 seconds, I guess. Yeah. And you'd have something pretty white um, that we never wanted to make white stuff. We don't drink a lot of white spirits. Um, it's part of the reason if, People don't think it's weird that we haven't made a gin or something like that. We we tend to stick with stuff that we drink a lot of. I don't know how you could make something really good if it's not something that you enjoy and partake of regularly. That'd be a really hard thing yeah. to assess the quality of a gin if nobody here drinks gin. Right. Um, so rum was the first thing that some of my bartenders up at the front of house really wanted something non-brown to work with for cocktails on the bar. And as much as I think we maybe are known or perceived as being kind of rambunctious and we're going to color outside the lines, we're probably a lot more traditionalist than people realize. So of the things we make, you know, white whiskey is historically not really much of a thing outside of moonshine, but white rum is, and I've, we have, and a lot of the guys on the sensory side, we'd be really been enjoying a lot of the four square releases and even picks up, picked up some of the Valier, you know, Clarins last a couple of years back when I was in London. Um, and to see all that super funky estuary stuff, in a white unaged spirit was kind of like, oh, we can do this. It actually does have a tradition. This is not an abnormal thing for, for the rum world. Um, so we felt comfortable doing that and giving them white rum to play with, but no, we mm -hmm. haven't done anything with white whiskey. Um, that would be a tough one. Yeah. I wouldn't mind doing it as like an educational thing, like an exposure yeah. to have behind the bar to have new make just for people to be able to look at finished product and yeah. stuff right off the stills. but. Sorry if you're super into white whiskey. Um, <laughs> it's not going to uh, happen. <laughs> probably not going to happen. Not on any scale anyway. All right. Uh, well, I will leave it at that. We're at the hour mark. Um, I know you are a very busy man, so uh, I yeah. am very grateful that you took the time to come and, you know, Absolutely. fill up our, our whiskey cup, so to speak. And uh, yeah, so if anybody, when this, you know, quarantine is over and we're able to travel again, if you find yourself in Waco, Texas... I say go say hi to Jared at, yeah, at Balcones and, uh, you know, have a few drams. And, uh, yeah, so thank you again. Absolutely. And thanks. Thank, yeah, thanks for everyone for tuning in. And uh, we'll be back next week with with episode three, talking terroir. So, with who? Um, Who's up next? Um, so I'm going to be talking with Ned Gahan, the head distiller for Waterford over in Waterford, Ireland. Nice. So, yeah. They're doing some cool stuff over there. They are doing nuts. some very cool stuff over there. So, um, that'll be a fun one. So cool. if you're around, if you're, you know, not too busy making whiskey. Yeah, maybe I'll pop know. in and. Yeah, and, uh, pop in. 
troll him, send him some, yeah, razz him a little bit, harass him. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> cool. All right, well, thank you awesome. so much, Jared. I appreciate it. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers.